I want to argue the other side. Like, okay, so if I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know, I want to become a better free throw shooter. So I'm going to work on a basketball and we're going to tighten down the rim a little bit to make that thing just the size of a thimble and really hone in on making, you know, working on, on that part of it. Why can't it work the same way for golf clubs? If I have a smaller sweet spot. Well, what you're talking about is will smaller hands make you a better free throw shooter? <laughs> All right, everybody. How you living? No putts given. Tony, we're back. You have a Cobra bag in the background and what appears to be a locker yeah that's uh, that was that was always at the root the locker just easier to see it. what's in the locker tony uh, it's it's a miscellaneous collection of crap but when it came originally it was three tailor and six irons they're going way back like when they when they first launched the slot technology they did like a media kit with their their three base slot irons i think it was face uh-huh. slots oh, some kind of slot. it's always a slot yeah so i just held on to it because i mean one it's it's kind of cool sure yeah, two like <laughs> what are you gonna do with it like, i mean what's gonna add to the trash bill if you try and get rid of it so there are probably like a hundred of us media guys that have these lockers somewhere in their house and the wives are like what the hell is it? it's <laughs> awesome why do you have a locker in there but which may lead to a question I may ask you a little bit later in today's episode. But before we get to that, Tony, I got burning questions, burning questions as we get here into September-ish. You know, we're getting to that kind of weird shoulder season. The industry releases are kind of done. You know, you might get some kind of stuff here in the fall a little bit. But I think, yeah, I mean, we're technic. As far as I'm concerned, everything from here on out is is definitely 2023. That's Yeah, sure. and it's winding down the season in the sense that you will start getting some different weather stuff in different places. And yeah, people are are starting to turn that page or if not turn it entirely, they're kind of aware they're going to be turning the page to the next season here. So we're getting questions about the next things and, and some of those kind of stuff, but we get interesting questions this time of year. Often one of those questions being Tony, I've been struggling with my game. I want to get better at this. I want to get better at that. You know, people kind of have over the year developed, you know, either habits or frustrations. And we get questions about, you know, lessons or new equipment coming out or, you know, what should I do with this, that, whatever. Let's talk about muscle back irons, Tony, because we hear this topic. (laughs) This question, will blades make me a better golfer? And first of all, let's unpack that question. So oh, what, what am I actually asking <laughs> or, but we get this a lot. People ask. It's, I mean, we, yeah, this one, there is a, uh, this is definitely squarely in that, that realm of mythology that we sometimes encounter for sure. So what's the yeah, question? I mean, I mean, what are people really asking by asking that though? What are they? I think it's sort of like the, you see it with higher handicapped golfers quite a bit. This. Mm-hmm. And it's always like, I play blades because they will make me a better ball striker. Mm -hmm. And that one, I just don't, uh, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. But so here's a Mizuno. This is uh, one of my favorite Uh, clubs of all time. Maybe seen that one. This is a. Uh, a three a iron, three iron. Just this is yeah, an MP5 nobody five anymore. Just about nobody. Yeah, this is an MP5 three iron, and um, you know, question being, let's think about it from this standpoint, right? Muscle back irons are inherently less forgiving than other types or styles of irons, right? You have a lot of weight uh, centered kind of, you know, mass. Well, let's and, be careful. Like, let's be careful though. I lower MOI. Let's. Right, maybe, and that's that's uh, often a strong correlation with forgiveness, mm-hmm. but not the only measure. So certainly lower MOI. Okay, so the idea being, in a muscle back iron, you have more weight and mass just in general, uh, kind of toward the center of the iron, right? Kind of right, kind of behind impact. Behind the high sweet spot, behind yep. the sweet spot. And then you notice very, very little weight or material or mass around the perimeter. 
of the iron. This is true. So, so why would somebody even suggest that hitting an iron like this could make me a better ball striker? Because in my head, I go, okay, well, I think I even heard Tiger say something to this effect, and maybe I'm totally misquoting him, and, and it's possible that I am. But this is going back to the, you know, the, I think it was the PNC, whatever, father-son challenge when Tiger actually had stealth out and started some of the hype around that. But I remember looking at his son, Charlie, uh, I think there were some tailor-made irons that he had kind of made up for him. And these were definitely low MOI, low forgiveness, whatever, muscle back player style irons with the idea of being, and again, I think Tiger said something to this effect that, you know, I want him to learn how to strike the ball appropriately. Kind of like, I don't want any training wheels on there. I don't want, you know, somebody to learn how to bowl by putting the bumpers in the, <laughs> you know, in the gutters and getting this false sense of, hey, I'm better than I kind of am. I think, you know, if we can punish shots that aren't good, that eventually what you're going to be left with is that kind of feedback that you want to establish. And, you know, you can always go to more forgiving things down the road. But, you know, if you, if you practice with one of these or if you get into a set of blade irons, it's going to help you become a better ball striker because you can't afford to miss. Right? Sure. I mean, I, I don't know, right? You don't want to, I, I get, I guess the Tiger Woods perspective is always going to be a little bit different than, than the average guy's perspective. And, you know, certainly Charlie is going to have more time to practice in a, uh, in a more structured environment than average golfers of the world. Like we don't, yeah, how many how many hours a week do the average golfer spend at the range? Uh, Not enough, sort of thing. And so yeah. it's it's for for the rest of us. I feel like the clubs that you practice with are the clubs that you play with. And I I just don't understand why anybody would would want to go out and play worse golf for the idea that you know if I play enough bad golf with a blade, eventually I'm going to start playing good golf. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so to me, I want to argue the other side. Like, okay, so if I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know, I want to become a better free throw shooter. So I'm going to work on a basketball and we're going to tighten down the rim a little bit. So instead of being the standard size rim, you know, they reduce it down a little bit and I can't get away with the typical misses that I might anymore. So I'm going to really, you know, make that thing just the size of a thimble and really hone in on making you know, working on, on that part of it, why can't it work the same way for golf clubs? If I have a smaller sweet spot, well, well, I'm not I going think it to does in theory, but I think your analogies. Are... Why? So if you, you listen to guys like Lou Stagner, um, one of the things he talks about sometimes is choosing more precise targets. And that's what you're talking about when you say shrink the rim, right? You are, you are reducing the target. And so Right. You know, rather than say, hey, aim for the area of the middle of the green, or even, hey, I'm going to add aim for that tree trunk. One of the things Lou has talked about is pick a branch or even a leaf, aim for that. Go for a smaller target. Whereas what you're talking about is, will smaller hands make you a better free throw shooter? So <laughs> I think it's just sort of a, a I different way they put. I don't know. And, and maybe, I mean, maybe having like little trumpy hands will make you a better <laughs> free throw shooter, but I, I don't know. And, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just, I don't understand how, hey, give me, give me a sweet spot, spot so small that all I'm going to do is miss it. And that's somehow going to make me hit it more often. Does, does missing anything make you hit it more often? I don't know. Like, but I that's struggle but, with it. I yeah, struggle it, with it. So it's a messy analogy. It's a messy thing. We have the idea that, you know, Muscle back irons that today still are more forgiving than muscle back irons of the, you know, Hogan Apex mm -hmm. uh, era, Wilson Staff Blade era, all those kind of things, no doubt. Um, but that was the only option for for the most part. So you got investment casting and ping and and some of these things. So let's move to this conversation for for golfers that are out there. Should any golfer that's watching this buy muscle backs? Should any of them out there be buying one of, one of these? Somebody probably should. So I remember we talked to Paul oh, Wood. Who is that person? Well, I don't know. 
I, I know that it's probably not a healthy percentage of golfers who are buying muscle back. So and we talked to Paul Wood from Payne back when the, when the eye blade launched and they had done some research yeah. and yeah, obviously they're, they're dealing with tour players, elite right. golfers. And they found that, yeah, in, in some cases for some of these players, depending on impact conditions and the launch and spin they generate, they actually got better performance out of the eye blade. But the, the thing I want to reinforce here is that was elite players for some elite players the blade was better than than a cavity back. And we're talking a small cavity back, but still better than the cavity back. Uh, but I would wager that has a lot to do with with launch and spin. And then we get into the the workability thing and in in terms of what that what that means from a design perspective. Right. When golfers say right. workable in the real world, they're like, oh, I can I can hit draws and fades, you know, alter my trajectory. Um, but a good bit about what that means from the design side is, you know, what is the length of that blade and how does that sort of affect the rotation and twisting of the golf club? And so mm -hmm. you know, some people, some elite players who hit the center of the face anyway, and that, again, that's the other piece of it, right? If you're, if you're going to hit the center of the face of a blade or the center of the face of a cavity back more often than not, nobody's 100%. Then, then you can really start to look at those other factors. Like, is this the way this club is bending and twisting because of that that relationship between the blade length and the shaft axis? Is that is that hurting me, helping me? Neutral, right? Better, worse, the same. We talk about that from time to time. But I think as soon as so again, it's that's the argument of, of, from a performance characteristic in terms of ball flight. But in, in terms of like, uh, I miss the sweet spot, so I'm going to play this blade to teach me how to hit the sweet spot. I don't, I don't know that there's any evidence of that. I've never, I've never heard of an instructor working with a player and going, Hey, you know what? You're, you're struggling here. I think we should put you in a blade. I, you know, maybe we'll have Ian Frazier on and talk to him about some of the stuff he sees in fittings, but I, I doubt, right. and I don't know this for a fact, but right. I doubt that he's ever been in a fitting situation where a guy is not hitting the middle of the face. And so he says, you know what? Like the answer to your, your inconsistency as an, an average mid to high handicap golfer is to put you in a blade. I just, maybe it happens. I don't know. I just, I can't imagine that it does and certainly not often. So I, and the other thing, and we, we, you know, a little tongue in cheek here, but you know, if, if every golf company, and I've never heard anybody tell me this, but if golf companies believe that playing blades would lead to more consistent contact and make average golfers better golfers over time. Right. I, I think every manufacturer would make a forged blade in a left-handed model and you don't see that. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, no, no, maybe, may, and maybe, I don't know, maybe blades only make right-handed golfers. <laughs> I, I don't it, I know. It, it's something in the physics. I don't know. I it's don't possible. Know. It's possible. So I want to go back to that question. Who should play a blade? It sounds like, I mean, part of it is I get there's preference and vanity and things and, and, you know, if you wanted to throw a handicapped number on it or something like that, it, it is probably fair to say that no one that you or I know or play with routinely or regularly would qualify as, as such. But even when you look like at strokes gain stuff on PJ tour, look at, you know, kind of the most elite golfers on the planet, right. Which, you know, like you said, we we're mentioning what's paying with some of those people. Um, okay. Yet still, Jordan Spieth, Will Zalatoris, Colin Morikawa, John Rahm. You got, they're all playing players, cavity backs to, to some degree. And yes, you have your Justin Thomases. You have your, you know, uh, uh, you know, put Scotty Scheffler. Obviously, can't forget about Scotty Scheffler, right? Um, Rory McIlroy. You, you have guys that are playing muscle back irons. But again... Looking in the bag of those players to see what they're playing is at least neutral, if not entirely detrimental for any other golfer on the planet, other than you're just like, oh, that's entertaining. I want to listen to see. Not a lot of golf. 12 handicaps on the PGA Tour, though. <laughs> that's <laughs> different, right. right? So, I mean, so why? So how many, how many blades do you see at like the AT and T Pro Am in those in those Am bags? I wonder. Like, is Chris Berman playing blades? Is it... No, no. So, so why make them that? Like, I guess that's a question, right? Because like, somebody what? wants them, and you do. 
why you make them, it is, it is kind of a showpiece and you, it is sort of a, it's the word I'm looking for, but it, it shows your capabilities to a degree as a, as a company, not necessarily a high tech golf company, but in terms of like artistry and purity, purity of the game. This is what we are capable. We are so the resume it. piece. It is, it is. I think so. And everybody, yeah. everybody wants it on the resume. And if you, if you went from, ask any company, if you went, went from one to the next, not only does, does the data already show to, you know, what is the least, the lowest seller in your iron lineup, it's going right. to be delayed. And then the next question is, would it, would it fundamentally impact your business if you didn't offer? And in terms of the bottom line, I think the answer is no, it, but it very likely could impact perceptions of the business, which does trickle down, but the blade itself, I don't, I don't think anybody would, would lose anything other than again, this aura of credibility from not having it. It's not a, it's not a performance piece. Nobody no. puts that in you know, and I'm sure everybody says we're going to, we're going to make the best performing blade that we can make, but it's, it's not a performance. We have the design almost never changes. Like, oh, hey, look, we, we, we smoothed out this transition and look, there's a curve here where there wasn't a curve, but right. A blade is a blade is a blade for the most well, part. That's why you get guys. I mean, think about an ad, again, Adam Scott, or I would throw in, um, uh, like a web Simpson, right. Where people are going, you know, both guys had played titles for a long time. Obviously Adam Scott isn't, he's playing a set of my stuff, um, you know, with that. But when you look at the blade itself, the design, it's, you're going back to the title of 680, you know, kind of era stuff, not even necessarily into the 690 series. And so, like you said, blade is a blade is a blade. Some are a little bit longer heel to toe. Some have a little bit more offset. Uh, that's some of the guys like some have a little bit less offset. Some are a little bit, um, you know, more cambered in the soul. It really is about those little, you know, we're little... just going to tweak it and tune it. And, you know, that'll be, will be fun, but I, I don't know if, if if you know, and we'll we'll have Vosh back on from Mizuno, but I don't I don't know yeah. if he would tell you that their newest blade is that significantly different from a performance perspective from anything they made ten years ago. And if you right. ask him any manufacturer about the rest of their iron line, the where we start talking about the cavity backs, even the players' cavity backs, and then when you get into the players' distance space, which didn't even exist a decade ago, and you're going to see quantifiable performance gains with all of those and the blade is largely unchanged because mm -hmm. it's when we talk about blade putters being no tech putters primarily you know, right fa right but these you know face milling okay there's a little thing you can do but when you're dealing with a milled putter without yep. an insert without any of that you're you're talking about at best a low tech putter yep and on the on the iron side that's what a blade is it's a very low tech to no tech golf club Mm -hmm. like as a as an average golfer, and I, I've gotten to the point where I actually qualify by the numbers as above average, which is <laughs> remarkable. And the talking was that may sound. <laughs> I know, right? Um, as, a, as a slightly above average golfer who is capable of playing like a well below average golfer, I don't. It's just it's nothing I would seriously consider. Certainly in the bulk of my set, right now I will. I play a, a forty six degree Volky pitching wedge. And there are reasons that why I do that are that are performance related. We, mm -hmm. we wrote an article about this last year. The differences between like a, a specialty wedge, like a Voki, and what would come in your set. So there, there's a performance reason why I do that, and I do that knowing that I am sacrificing a little bit of forgiveness. But again, we've we've talked about this before. But once you get past, say, and it depends on the golfer a little bit, but once you and, and the makeup of the set. But once you get past the traditional eight iron or what is now an eight iron, you're not getting a ton of that MOI technology benefit anyway. Right. And so you got some wiggle room there to, to maybe play with something that's going to help you find the center of the face or whatever the argument is. But yeah, certainly not in the bulk of the iron set. So yeah. I, I think I what, would... you made me think of a question though for you, which is what you were just talking about there with the 46 degree pitching wedge that you play right so we kind of see we tend to treat irons as a set even though the reality is that 
you really have 14 individual clubs in your bag. And, and just looking at even, again, go back to golfers, we should never compare ourselves to the, you know, Webb Simpsons, Justin Thomas's, Colin Morikawa, John Ron, blah, 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 all these people. A lot of times, even if they are playing a muscle back iron, they're not playing it in a three, four, sometimes even a five iron, right? They're well, playing. Not, I mean, it's, it's hard to find a three iron. That's all become like that, found it. that utility iron. Well, yeah, but found it. How old is that? How old is that one? I don't know. It's an MP5. Okay. Do you know MP5? <laughs> Paul Casey bagged these for, for a long, long time. Might still bag them as far as I know. But, okay, so consider this then. Let's say that we're even seeing a trend on tour where the most elite ball strikers aren't playing, by and large, three, four, five irons in a muscle back, even if they are in a six through nine iron pitching wedge scenario, right? Then on the other hand, at a certain point, whether that's a nine iron loft of 40 to 42 degrees, depending on manufacturing, whatever, I think kind of what you're talking about is you have more of that glancing blow, right? Where the more loft and, and spin loft that you're putting on a shot, right? It's less of that twisting or forgiveness MOI kind of stuff, right? Well, you get that exactly. in the face tech, the face technology too. Right? So yeah, that, well, the ball's going. That's why I see a lot of sets like these these super high tech irons. By the time you get from you know going into the eighth and nine, the wedge, that technology fades because it's it's just not needed. And so you do see manufacturers going, all right, what can I do here that provides maybe a little better feel and a little bit of that. I think it gets called shot making versatility quite a bit. So that's that's <laughs> sure. the other piece of it, right? Can I can I for, forego forgiveness in these irons where there's less forgiveness benefit anyway in favor of shot making versatility? And so yeah. like if you if you were to say to me, Hey, you know, should I consider more shot making versatility in the in the short end of my bag? I I might say yes, although I would still be hesitant to say, Yeah, just you know, from eight on go to blades. Like that's right. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think what you're talking about too is we're seeing a shift maybe even within the industry of, of like you said, the technology, when you actually look at the technology in an, in a set of irons from say four iron through pitching wedge and the things that it might have in five iron, six iron, seven iron, thinner faces, different types of materials, maybe um, the variable face thicknesses, how they actually construct it. Like you said, a lot of times that stuff is kind of waned or it's kind of titrated out by the time you get to nine iron pitching wedge because, like you said, it's of less benefit. So maybe there's an argument there that if you say, hey, it's not that forgiving anyway. What difference does it make if I play a nine iron or a pitching wedge in a traditional muscle back? But again, what's the benefit? It's not that it's like, hey, there's a cost, but it's like, what's the actual benefit of, of doing that? You know, this, that is an interesting question. And I go back to our, our testing from time to time. And we're, I think, I think, don't hold me to this, but we're kind of kicking the tires on a, on a, on a test that actually compares blades to a cavity back and maybe even an SG iron to really kind of put some numbers on this from, from average golfers. But one of the things we say think we see, because we, we haven't done a deep dive on it. Right. But I, I do feel like when we get into, the short iron portion of our test, um, you do tend to see situations where what is on paper a less forgiving club does tend to be closer to the pin, probably equidistant on average, but the the best shots tend to be a little bit closer. So again, mm -hmm. that's you know, that shot making precision, if you will. Uh, yeah. so there's an argument there, but that's a for for playing kind of a, a smaller, more workable. Uh, short iron, but that's, that's a far cry from going, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to load up this bag with blades from the three iron to the pitching wedge. And, you know, I'm going to get the smallest wedges I can find. And I'm, I'm going to go out and shoot 102 until I suddenly break seven. Right. Cause I, I, you know, if they made me a better ball striker, <laughs> like I don't, I don't get that piece of it. Still. Yeah. So but, bottom line, will muscle back irons make you a better Ball striker, will holding your breath for a long period of time make you appreciate breathing more? And what's, what's the end game I, with this? I, yeah. Like, okay, I, uh, I, I put blades in the bag, and I know if I keep playing these blades, just if I just try hard and keep at it, 
I'm going to eventually become a better ball striker. At what point in this conversation do I feel like I have achieved enough ball striking prowess that I can take the <laughs> blades out of the bag, right? It becomes almost counter to what it should be. Like. I, I have played right. blades and gotten gotten so proficient at striking a golf ball that I am now going to go play a cavity back. <laughs> right, because I have the right level of appreciation for what happens on a miss hit with the muscle back that now I can fully utilize my player CV. Now that now that I fully comprehend it, I understand it. I have performed my way around it. So now I no longer have to suffer for it. Yeah. I, mean, I don't I don't I don't play enough golf and I play more golf than a lot of people, but I don't play enough golf where I'm willing to go out and just shoot terrible, terrible scores on the off chance that you know, if I keep shooting terrible scores long enough, might you know, burn something. They, they just come come down. I just feel like that time and money would be better spent on a in a lesson bay or yeah, you know, maybe getting fit. Well, taking all of this, you know, I, I will say for the guy who who needs to feel good about playing blades, we're not we're not trying to make anybody feel bad. We're not trying to crap on anybody. At the no, end of the play day, want to play? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the most forgiving iron you're going to play is the one that you hit in the center most often. And you can take MOI and forgiveness and shot making versatility, whatever language you want to use around that, throw it out the window. The one you hit in the middle of the face most often is going to be the one that that is best for you. Yep, yep. And we'll see. Yeah, I'm sure there are plenty of people that play muscle backs that swear by them that this that whatever, but. And we're not saying don't play them or don't do this. Enjoy. Play what you want to play. You know? <laughs> but but if you're playing a muscle back iron because you think it makes you a better ball striker, maybe just stop and take a minute and really think critically through that. So I that just I want to know what the end game is. Play. When what? Are you are are you really? Is is that what we're really doing here? You know? When when have blades made me so proficient as a ball striker that I no longer need to play blades? I have become too is that too proficient for blades? I don't know. What's what is that? I, I don't know. I'm I'm so far removed from that area anyway. I don't I don't know yeah. that would be. Yeah. I don't know. Well I'd like to experience it though. I mean, like you said, we got a couple of guests coming on here hopefully in a couple of weeks so we can dig a little deeper on a couple of those topics but I, I i scoured through the mailbag tony mailbag right. yeah we did and i found two questions semi-related semi-related that i want to get your pick Cousin, brain like first cousin second like how rudy giuliani what are we talking about <laughs> are close I, well it's at least first cousins maybe once removed um, okay we know that we're in that time of the season people that have played golf are you know at that point in the season where maybe they're thinking about, hey, I want to get fit. Should I get fit now as I'm kind of getting toward the last third of the season, maybe, or the last quarter of the season? Am I better off to get fit now based on what I've seen, done, experienced this year? Like, I'm really close to that, right? Because I've been playing a bunch and blah, blah, blah. Like, pretty good handle what I'm doing well, not doing well. If I track stats, if I don't whatever, but we're kind of at the end of a life cycle, right? Of a lot of clubs. And like you said, pretty much everything we're talking about hearing, discussing with companies, like we're talking stuff that's coming out February, March, April, whatever, 2023 stuff. So should I get fit now today for end of cycle clubs with maybe more authentically who I am as a golfer, or should I wait a little bit, see what's coming out, November, December, January, knowing that that might be the early version of my golf herself in 2023, which one, which one should I err on? Well, let, let's start by acknowledging that there is a segment of golfers whom I am very jealous who don't experience the seasonality of a golf. <laughs> golf is a, a year round sport. It's not like, you know, I, I would say we probably. We should probably start looking at, at mid October is like maybe the nails aren't in the coffin, but yeah, you know, there's a there's a guy that's got a fistful of them and a hammer. Like you know, mm -hmm. it's only a matter of time. So, but that's a for month those, for you. So it's right? like a month away from now. Yeah, for those for those guys who are lucky enough to experience year round golf, it's not a concern. But to to your question, yeah, I think screw you, Scottsdale. 
Yeah, if, you, if you're going to get snowed on, uh, this is, when you've been playing all year to this point, this is the best time to get fit. Absolutely. You are theoretically grooved. Your swing is what it's going to be. So you're in a really good place to, to kind of go in and, and work with a fitter and say, yeah, this is, this is who I am. This is what I got. Let's, let's work with this and get me something good so that I'm able to, to hit the ground running in, in the spring when this thaws. Now, you know, unfortunately, I think the majority of the golf industry doesn't see it that way. Our title is just released, but the fall mm -hmm. release is rare. And I think we can say Mizuno has some stuff coming here that you'll theoretically be able to get fit for before the snow falls. I don't, I don't know if you'll actually receive it. That's a whole other conversation <laughs> still. Right. Uh, but theoretically. Yeah. So the rest of the, I would say like these January, February releases, they don't do golfers any favors in terms of fitting. Again, if, if you are like, like we are, and we don't have like endless golf, if we have an actual, you know, Hey, we're, we got to shut it down. Mm-hmm. Going into a store in the spring when, hey, everything is fresh and it's exciting and you want it all, but you've also been kind of chilling out for three or four months, sometimes five months. So it's, it's probably not the best time to get fit. Whereas right about now, man, like you're, mm -hmm. you're in it. You've got what you've got. You know what's going on. You maybe even feel good about things. Like, yeah, this is, this is when I, I would like to most to get fit for sure. You at least have something you maybe feel good about throughout your yeah, life. And you, know, you kind of have a sense of, of what you need. I, mm -hmm. I, my, my five wood just isn't what I need it to be. Maybe I need something into the bag at that point in the bag. And I know this because I've had six months of, of it not doing what I need it to do or whatever the case might be. Yeah. So here's the corollary to that. So you're saying, given those two fit now with, let's just call it, end of cycle equipment like if there's stuff well, some of it's end of cycle some of it's relatively new some of it's mid cycle i mean mm -hmm. so basic point being don't wait for the newest stuff in order to get fit if you if get yeah, fit, i mean if you're gonna if you're gonna buy blades to be a better ball striker <laughs> for example like that's a in a lot of cases that's a for for a lot of companies that's a three-year window so i don't want to like the good news there is you're not yeah it's like but yeah. prioritize when you're going to get the best, most accurate fitting. That's going to be more important than whether you're getting fit for something that comes out in two months, three months, four months, as opposed to, you know, again, like you said, inline or existing, even mid-cycle equipment. And I think we have to acknowledge, and I've said this before, like sometimes newer is better. Like there's a, there's a yeah. hard, hey, almost everybody gets more yardage with this new thing than the old widget. But right. a lot of times newer is just different. Like, hey, we, we added a new feature and we moved the center of gravity around and we, we did some things and these things that we did are going to be beneficial for the guy who had our previous driver or club, whatever it happens to be. But also mm -hmm. these things that we did may not be beneficial for some of the guys that have our previous driver or club or whatever it happens to be. So yeah, yeah. a lot of times there's not a ton to be gained and I guess probably almost never is there a ton to be gained. Sometimes it's no, little. yeah, sometimes and sometimes newer is just a better fit for who you are as a golfer. Yeah, and to your point, it's it's the I hate it when I get coupons in the mail when there's like, hey, you know, spend twenty five dollars. Right, oh yeah, you'll see. Okay. Spend, you know, hey, here's a twenty five dollar gift card to this place if you spend, you know, fifty bucks or whatever. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, because they give me every time. Yeah, but. It's only saving you money, really, if you already spend that money there. Otherwise, you're just spending more money to save a little bit, and you get suckered into it, right? Or if I spend seventy five, I can I'll save twenty five. <laughs> <laughs> right, where it's the same thing. Where a newer technology or something, it, it it may be improved, but if it's not improved in an area that helps you then there's actually no improvement, like, right? So let's say the newest technology a company comes out with is, hey, we really focused all of our energy and effort on helping golfers correct a slice. Well, if that's not your miss, if that's not the shot you need help with, that newer technology doesn't actually necessarily do anything for you. Hence, I'll use a Brooke Henderson as an example. I think she's still playing like Ping G400 series. Uh, a good series. Great series. So there's obviously things about 410 and what should have been 420, big miss thing, for, you know, that didn't necessarily find any improvements over. So I, I think it, you're right. I think it's being wary of, 
hey, is that new better thing actually better for you? Last question. Is it possible that shorter is the new longer? You'll never sell it. You'll never sell it. So, but it I just be. saw Brandon Matthews, this guy at Corn Ferry Tour, right? Like Corn Ferry Tour finals, last hole. He needs to make eagle on 18. It's a dog leg. I want to say it's like a dog leg, right? Par four. In line with the green is like a 370 yard carry over water. So it's not like you can miss. Uh, he takes a line, didn't even take it in the practice round. Carries it on the green. On the green. I saw this guy at my home course, Corn Ferry event, hit a drive. Yeah, it's at altitude, whatever. 460, 470. It was ridiculous. His driver length, just shy of 44 inches. It's like 43 and 7 eighths or something right in there, as confirmed by the Strixon Tour rep. So if a guy like that, isn't hey, yeah i'm sure a club that's an inch longer inch and a half longer he could swing faster now granted he swings already fast enough whatever but can you or me take something from that going you know maybe i should look at a 44 inch driver 44 and a half can so shorter I be the think, new longer i think i don't know this for a fact this is just some stuff tony thinks probably is true may have happened <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think if you were to ask, go from from golf company to golf company, and maybe you inject somebody with some true serum here, and say, if you were building a club for optimal performance, and I, I guess in today's world, a driver, we'll talk about a driver. In today's world, that optimal performance metric is probably a strokes gain value of some kind. Mm -hmm. how you want to weight misses and things like that, but some right. sort of strokes gain based formulation. Okay. And I think if, if that is your metric and say, hey, we are we are trying to maximize strokes gained, I don't think you would and, and the question we ask is, hey, what is what is the optimal driver length? Again, for a for a broad market. We're trying to kind of hit the the bullseye of the whole market, knowing that yeah, the, that 80%. The, there will be exceptions. There are always exceptions to any rule in, in golf equipment. But if you're trying to hit the bulk and say, hey, what is what is the best blend of distance accuracy and, again, the strokes gain value, what length would you hit? I don't think it would be 45.5. I don't think it would be 45.75. I think you would see these things where, where somebody tells you, like, if you look at the spec, the the spec is 45.75 and you put it on a ruler, it's 46. Like you see right. all right. of these things. And I think, right. I think if you said, Hey, I want you to build a driver to what you think is the optimal performance spec for the most golfers, I think you'd probably be somewhere in the 44 and a half, maybe 45 range. Uh, but you, know, you talk to fitters. I remember talking to Josh when he was at New York golf center years ago. Mm -hmm. They don't. Josh, try to focus. Yeah, a lot of his stuff was sub forty five. Oh, I would probably, I would guess even the majority, and it's probably true at a lot of fitting locations. It's just it. You start to think like the if you ballpark it, top drivers on the market, the the difference in in just pure distance is maybe again if you're dealing with with good stuff that fits you reasonably well. Mm -hmm. Five yards, give or take, for most golfers, and and so, how much how much more was be gained by hey, I'm going to sacrifice five yards for those handful of times a year for maybe maybe it's even once around that I mm -hmm. absolutely hit it dead nut center, but I'm gonna right. hit, my misses are going to be better because I'm not as far off the center when I miss, and I'm going to keep it straighter, closer in the fairway, and closer to the fairway. Yeah, I think. I think that's where the benefit is. So, yeah, chances are golfers are probably playing drivers that are too long. But getting back to what I said at the beginning, there, why I think this is, you know, we've seen this this length go up, and what happens is like somebody increases their length. Right. Like, well, shit, we're gonna we're gonna lose that home run derby in the hitting bay if we don't if we don't match them, because mm -hmm. those guys that's that's you know typically a guy walking into a Dick's Sporting Goods 
or or any pro shop that lets you go into a bay by yourself and and whack whack to your heart's content or even sort of whack with minimal supervision the guy that's going yeah that one was good yep like you're not going to win that yeah. battle if you go in with a with a shorter length drive you're going to lose every time and and losing that battle nobody's going to go hell oh, you know i uh i hit five really good ones here on on 30 swings or 40 swings whatever it is but you know, the, the standard deviations were a little bit tighter on the, on the shorter one. Nobody, right. nobody's looking at that. And that's no. Yeah. And it's so even a potential to. thing. Like I noticed this, um, part of the reason I bring the question up is I'm currently, uh, working around working with a driver that's 44 and a half inches, experimenting with that and seeing, seeing some really, really positive results, things that I like, but something that even I noticed right away is like. It was one to two miles an hour slower in terms of swing speed than the one that was like 45 and a half, right? right. So, but that's a, that's a potential thing, right? How many golf clubs are sold on potential and hope, which is that home run derby idea of, oh, well, I swing this one 114, but I swing this one 110 or 111. Jeez, well, 130, how many yards, yeah. How many yards am I leaving on the table? by going with the one that's one to two, three miles an hour slower, if you will. Um, right. Right. That's that home run derby analysis. So how, like sit, but who's going to buy that driver? What company is going to come out and say, Hey, we have da -da 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 -da, efficiency and accuracy. The straightest you know, driver in golf. It's, you know, well, maybe nobody sufficient length. That's who what we have. <laughs> We're only marginally shorter, significantly right. straighter. Like that's, you know, however yeah, you work it would that, help you're going to, you know, golfers shoot lower. You're gonna, that would actually help golfers. And I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that message resonates with the driver category. I'm not, I'm not interested in shooting lower scores with my driver. And I think maybe well, that, it bombs. I think average golfers may not consider the driver a scoring club, but that's kind of where it all starts, right? You set up the rest of the hole with that club. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, man, I get shorter, but straighter is that's never, ever going to work. Nope. That's a great question though. I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that. What you said, if we injected people with truth serum and said, Hey, if you really, you know, golf companies, if you really want to help golfers shoot the lowest score possible, we're not saying hit it short. We're saying, you know, take into account all balance. of these different things balanced. What would the optimal driver length be for the vast majority of players that are out there i think you're right tony it's not 45 and a half certainly isn't i bet it's 40 i'm gonna say something crazy i bet it's 43 and a half to 44 would be optimal i think you're probably a little low but it's it's probably closer to that than it is to 44 or 45 75 or 46 i mean seven. most golfers don't swing it that fast 85 90 miles an hour right? your average golfer so it's not like they're going to swing one longer that much further and they got to find the place on the golf uh, you know where, where it is the hottest we know companies are trying to make the other parts of the face hotter as hot as possible but still finding that sweet area sweet zone in the middle if i can do that with a club that's an inch inch and a half shorter am i not going to be better off same know. same rules apply yeah, even if it's a driver, the one you hit in the middle of the face more often is going to be the one that that's going to be better for you. And typically, you're going to hit a shorter club in the center of the face. Typically, there are exceptions, always exceptions, but yeah, the typical golfer is going to find center more often with a with a shorter shaft. Truth. So maybe shorter is the new longer. I don't know. Comment below. Let us know what you think. We got other topics, things. You got questions as always. Find us out on the interwebs, Golf Spy T, Golf Spy C. Let us know what you're thinking. What do you want? Hopes, dreams, questions. I think. Until next time, Tony. Quit playing blades. Quit playing blades. <laughs>